My experience tells me with 100% certainty the only thing that's going to happen is further escalation. Putin has no reverse gear, he has no ability to compromise, he doesn't negotiate, he just doubles down, triples down, and quadruples down. And so we should expect really nasty stuff in the future. More troops being drafted, more equipment coming in. There's now talk about China providing lethal equipment to the Russians and we should expect really nasty stuff going forward. So he's been in power for 22 years. In that 22 years, he and about a thousand people around him have stolen a trillion dollars from the Russian state. That's money that should have been spent on hospitals, schools, roads, was spent on private jets, villas, and Swiss bank accounts. And you can do that for a year or two or five, but you can't do it for 22 years without people getting angry. And at some point, Putin was afraid that people would be angry and say, Vladimir, we don't want you here anymore. And this is different than the British people saying to Boris Johnson, we don't want you here anymore. Boris Johnson can go and give speeches and have fun and feel safe. In Russia, if you get kicked out as a dictator, you go to jail, your money gets taken away, and you probably die. And so for Putin, he's scared to death of his own people. And the best way of dealing with that fear uh, and to deal with that anger is to try to get them angry at somebody else. It's Machiavelli 101. Create a foreign enemy, start a war, and so the Russian people will be mad at the enemy, not at Putin. That's what this war is all about. Well, P Putin has been losing this war. Um, even though he has more troops and more equipment than the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians are defending their homeland. They understand that if the Russians succeed, the men will be killed, the women raped, and the children taken away. That's a pretty big motivation. And so every time they get any kind of equipment to fight the Russians, they use it to ma its maximum possible advantage. Putin has been losing the war, but um, he doesn't care about loss of life. He's lost somewhere between 100 and 200,000 troops. And for him, he, his heart doesn't beat faster. His, he doesn't feel bad at night when he goes to sleep. He'll just draft another 200,000 and throw them into battle. And if they get killed, he'll draft another 200,000. For him, uh, nothing matters other than victory and uh, conquest over his enemies. And um, that's a hard, hard enemy to fight. I ran an investment fund called the Hermitage Fund in Russia starting in 1996. Gazprom, which is the largest company in Russia, was one of our largest investments. And what we discovered about Gazprom was that nine members of the management of Gazprom were stealing money on a proportion that no one's ever seen before. They were doing uh, things like transferring huge gas fields outside the company into new companies, and then the management themselves or their relatives would invest in these new companies or buy them from Gazprom for like $50,000 gas fields that were worth $10 billion. They also would take billions of dollars of gas, sell them for almost nothing into companies that they owned, and then those companies would sell the billions of dollars of gas to the market. And so if you added it all up, we calculated that between 1996 and 1999, nine members of Gazprom's management had stolen oil and gas reserves equal to the size of Kuwait out of the company. The Kuwait, I mean, it's, it's, it's an amount that, it's an unimaginable amount of money was stolen, hundreds of billions was stolen out of this company. So when Putin came to power, he wasn't this, um, guy he is today. He wasn't this uh, ruthless dictator. He was kind of weak because the oligarchs had stolen um, his power from him in the same way as they were stealing money from me. And so we have this alignment of interests and there's this expression, your enemy's enemy is your friend. And Putin was going after the oligarchs because they were stealing power from him. I was going after the oligarchs because they were stealing money from me. And we had this alignment of interest. Now, I've never met Vladimir Putin. I never spoke to him then or since then. But every time I would then put one of these scandals out there, um, share it with the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, uh, Putin would step in. And he would use whatever limited power he had to crush the oligarchs. And in doing so, the share prices of the companies that I invested in started to go up. And so for a brief period of time, I thought he was a good guy because um, he was crushing corrupt oligarchs. Turned out that um, that was just temporary. He ended up winning his war with the oligarchs by arresting the richest man in the country, 
a man named Mikhail Hordakovsky, who was the owner of an oil company called Yukos. He arrested him, he put him on trial, and he allowed the television cameras to come into the courtroom and film the richest man in Russia on trial, sitting in a cage. And in doing so, um, all the other oligarchs said, oh my God, I don't want to be sitting in the cage myself. And they went to Putin and said, Vladimir, what do we have to do so we don't sit in a cage? He said, it's real simple. I want 50%. And that's the moment that Putin became the richest man in the world. In 2005, Putin was now a beneficiary of the corruption, didn't want me exposing it anymore. And so I was expelled from the country. I was declared a threat to national security. And my offices were raided. They seized a bunch of documents. A young lawyer who worked for me named Sergei Magnitsky investigated the raids. He discovered that the purpose was to steal $230 million of taxes that my firm paid to the Russian government. That money was stolen from the Russian government by a bunch of corrupt officials. He exposed it. He testified against the officials. He was tortured for 358 days and killed in Russian police custody in 2009. I passed a law in the United States named the Magnitsky Act, which freezes the assets and bans the visas of Russian human rights violators, including those who killed Sergei Magnitsky. And that led to a massive retaliation from the Putin regime. They have put me on death lists. They put me on kidnapping lists. They've issued eight Interpol red notices to have me arrested. They've come to Britain asking the government to extradite me back to Russia. I've been arrested in Madrid and Geneva um, on Russian warrants. They've sued me, they've surveilled me, they've done all sorts of things. So far I've been able to survive, but uh, it hasn't been easy. So the Magnitsky Act was the template which was used to go after Putin's cronies and the oligarchs in Ukraine, freezing the assets, banning the visas. And Putin keeps his money with these oligarchs, so from one perspective, it's highly effective because if you want to go after Putin, it's like two fingers in the eye for Putin. The problem is that that money is frozen, but every day, Russia sells between 500 million and a billion dollars worth of oil and gas to the West. And as long as that money is coming in, that's enough money for them to fund their war. And so we might have frozen the assets of the oligarchs and also frozen the assets of the Russian Central Bank, we still continue to give Russia the money that they need to fund this war. And until we stop buying their oil and gas, that's gonna be a problem. But the moment there's 40 oligarchs who have had their assets frozen, there's 118 oligarchs on the Forbes rich list. A lot of oligarchs are still footloose and fancy free. In addition, there's a lot of oligarchs who have put money in, in the names of relatives and trustees and proxies and nominees around them who still function very profitably. And so the whole purpose of, of sanctioning the oligarchs requires that we get tougher, more creative, because they're pretty creative in their ways of evading sanctions. My, my um, analysis is there's very few people in Russia like Sergei Magnitsky. And those who have been like him are sitting in jail right now. And the message to all the other population is that you're gonna have a really hard life if you stand up to the regime. And most people in Russia are different than here. There's not a lot of public spiritedness in Russia. Those people who aren't happy with the war, what do they do? They leave the country. And literally a million people who have the resources to leave the country have left the country because of this war. They're not willing to go to Red Square, they're willing to go to Georgia or Armenia or Turkey or Dubai to sit out the war. Putin has the Russian public totally brainwashed. They believe that this is a righteous war they believe this is a war that justifies economic hardship. And anyone who doesn't believe that will never say it because anyone who says anything contrary to the war gets arrested and thrown in jail for at least eight years. In, in Russia, there is no democracy. He'd like to create a, a sort of fervent nationalism so people support the war. But at some point, if they don't support the war, then he's just gonna make them afraid to say anything bad about it. And so this is not a democracy. This is not a place where there's any free expression, where people um, can demonstrate their dislike of the government. And so he can last a lot longer than we can in our democracies where from day to day different people show up and say different things. These authoritarians are terrible threats to the West, the biggest threats to the West. Russia at the moment is the biggest threat. China is the second biggest, but that could easily ch change places at a moment's, in a moment's notice. Ha having said that, these countries 
are self-limiting. In the UK and in the US and Europe, if someone's doing something really stupid as a head of state, the people can kick them out. There's no self-correcting mechanisms in Russia and China. And so these people go on these terrible tangents, like what Putin is doing, and he's setting his country back 50 years. And um, uh, Russia will never be a great power. And probably China will never be a great power because they're going to make similar mistakes.